good morning on this most wonderful of Sundays, Easter Sunday. I start with the watchword from Revelations. Christ says, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Let us pray together. Thank you, Lord, for how good and great you are, that you are risen, truly God, exalted Lord, that you have conquered death and sin, and that we have our salvation in you. Lord, you are risen. Your grace is everywhere. And we can only thank you and praise you for this wonderful, wonderful thing. Amen. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We have two texts I want to read for us today. The first is from Mark chapter 16, the first eight verses. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him, him being Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in white in a white robe. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before them to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. In the oldest manuscripts of Mark, the story ends here. Remember, Mark is the oldest gospel and Matthew and Luke and maybe even John used Mark as a source. And the gospel of Mark was written for a church in Rome, the big city. And this was a small church suffering under persecution. Scholars tend to think the reason the story ends so abruptly is as a motivation for those reading the gospel. To stand strong and to not be afraid and run away, but to share this wonderful news. The story has been coming for a while. Through the 40 days of Lent, Maundry Thursday, where the Lord's Supper was instituted, on Friday where the most gruesome event was fulfilled. The Jewish Sabbath would have started on Friday evening, and so they would not have had time to properly prepare the body. And so a few women come to fulfill this custom. I'm not sure what their expectation was regarding the stone in front of the grave, but luckily the work has been done. It was already moved away. And the words they hear there, so soft, You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. They have to go and now share the words of the disciples and even Peter. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, he is mentioned as one who needs to hear these words. We would expect excitement here, but we see fear. What happened over the last few days is the most wonderful love story ever told. The most wonderful, joyful message ever shared. That the one who loves would sacrifice his life so that others can be saved, so that sins can be forgiven, so that relationships can be restored, so that all might come to see, know, and worship Lord God Almighty. How can this message not be heard with joy and excitement? Luckily, the word did get out. The woman probably shook off their initial shock and went to go tell those whom they were supposed to tell and to share this wonderful message with those who were still feeling scared, unsure, frightened, maybe feeling alone and lost. It is due to the fact that the word did get out, that the world was changed forever. And this is from what we read in the 1 Corinthians letter, our epistle today. I read from 1 Corinthians 15. 
Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters of the gospel, I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain, for I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Caiaphas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they. We preach, and so you believed. We see in the letters of the New Testament and in Gospels that there were some differences regarding theological opinions and doctrines. But in between all these doctrines, there must have been some form of an early creed which the early church was told to believe. And we see it in the letter of Corinthians, an example of this, where Paul speaks about the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. In our epistle text from the 1 Corinthians 15, Paul shares a very important theological doctrine, the death and resurrection of our Lord, because in its essence, this is the core of what Paul wants to proclaim. Christ, Christ crucified, Christ the risen Lord. This is the foundation on which the early church was built. For if Christ was not truly human, he could not suffer and carry our sins. If Christ was not resurrected, he would not have been exalted as Lord and sin would have won. But sin did not win. Christ was exalted. And this is the message that gives joy to millions of people across the world, millions whose hearts have been moved by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't look like Paul needs to convince them of the resurrection. For the text, it looks like the Corinthian church has already accepted the fact that Christ has been risen and that scripture has been fulfilled. What Paul is doing is giving them a reminder on the basis, the foundation on which their faith stands, that Christ has died and rose again. And this leads into the second point, that they are now living in a time of grace and not working alone in this time, not working out of their own strength, but with God by them. This time we are working and we are in now is a time of grace. It is not a time we just wait for the second coming. Some have already passed away before Christ come again, and we do not know when Christ will come again, be it a hundred, a thousand or many more years. When it will be is not important. What's important is that we all live in a world in a time of grace. Christ is not physically here, but we are filled, surrounded, supported, and led by this wonderful grace. This grace which Paul is proclaiming to them is so important and so overwhelming that even he, an untimely born, can be saved and used by God. Even me with my mistakes and, and you with yours are all called by grace, and nothing we can do in our past can make God not love us and have grace on us. In the end, words fall short, and all we can say is, He is risen, He is truly risen. In the end, all arguments and discussions fall short, and all we can do is sing, He is risen, He is truly risen. In the end, all ideas of justice and what is fair fall short, and all we can do is proclaim, He is risen, He is truly risen. This grace is both a comfort and a motivation. It is a comfort for we know that what has been written has been fulfilled. It all started with God and with God we will all end. It is the time in the middle we are in now. With Jesus' ministry on earth, the cross, the grave, the resurrection, now we have the Spirit which we'll celebrate in a few weeks. What do we take from Easter Sunday? Not only chocolate eggs and little bunnies, but a great message that even the women who ran away somehow got out, that changed the world, that even those who denied Jesus was given another opportunity to listen to this message, that the disciples, more than 500, and then even an untimely born as Paul, was told this message. This message, which is so wonderful, is not dependent on me, but on Christ's grace, 
spreading this message of love is not dependent on my strength, my knowledge or how good I am, but on God who works through me to spread this wonderful message of love, grace and fellowship. I don't know what more to say except that He is risen. He is truly risen. This is the foundation of our faith, the comfort that whatever may come, we live in the time of grace, loved by God and drawn together by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us share the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you on this most wonderful day. The Lord makes His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and gives you peace. Amen.